Okay, go away. Uh, well, hello again. It's David Willey, the curator from the Tank Museum, still doing a question and answer sessions at home. And this is now, I believe, our 16th question and answer session. So those of you who know whoops, what goes on, I've got the dog here because um, I'm working from home at the moment. So I have to throw the ball for the dog every now and again. And uh, I answer some questions that people have sent in. Sometimes you can pop them on the comments, sometimes questions are emailed in. And at the same time, because we are an independent charity, and as you can imagine, with the last few months, we've lost an awful lot of our annual income. So we're trying to sell you some things that you might be able to buy if you possibly can and support the museum or perhaps make a donation or join one of our schemes. So um, that's why I have the merchandise out. So many of you will know this. And as ever, I say thank you so much to those of you who have bought things from our shop. If you keep going back to it, because sometimes I know you've been trying to buy things that are no longer available or we may have restocked, we may have been able to change the postage on it as well. So do keep visiting. And, uh, and if you can't afford anything, I hope you just enjoy what we're putting out for you anyway. And uh, in these very interesting times we're all living through at the moment, I hope it just gives, adds another something to your day. So I'm going to start off by some of the questions um, that people have sent in. And uh, first question from someone called Communist Empire has asked, was the bison a good tank? Um, now, I don't know if I'm missing something here, but the bison to me, I know of two bisons at the Tank Museum. We have an armoured lorry called the bison, uh, which was one of those emergency measure vehicles. And it's an interesting story. I looked at the chap's name. Uh, Charles Bernard Matthews ran a concrete company, uh, Concrete Limited, and he had been an engineer in the First World War and he came up with a number of ideas of using concrete for defensive measures. So whether in World War I emplacements um, that could be prefabricated, etc. And in World War II, he kind of stole a march, as it were. He could see straight away that we'd lost a lot of our armoured vehicles out in France in 1940. And for Britain, there was these emergency measures. We needed things quickly in case the Germans were going to invade in the summer of autumn of uh, 1940. So what he did, he came up with a series of designs, showed them to the military, and uh, they made some comments to him about, you know, how this might work and basically he came up with improvised armoured pillboxes uh, or improvised vehicles with a pillbox on. They weren't really like armoured cars, they weren't supposed to go off driving around all over the place, but they could be manoeuvred on things like especially airfields, which we thought were particularly vulnerable. If the Germans had done as they'd done in France, Holland, um, where you know you either had an air landing or like in Belgium, then they could seize a, an airfield, so we needed to defend those. So what they were looking at is putting a mobile pillbox so it could go to the area that needed defending on the airfield um, and the chaps inside were safe. And they took a number of different vehicles, chassis, lorries, R1s um, is a recreation in a way using some of the original uh, concrete parts on a Thornycroft chassis. They came up with three main types of them and um, there's not quite sure but you know in the hundreds were made as um, as emergency measure vehicles now that's a bison and the bison it was called a bison because concrete limited their symbol was a bison so that ended up being called a bison from that point of view um, there's also a bison which was german self-propelled artillery which is where they got the panzer one chassis and they realized you know again like most of these things with uh, panzer units etc they wanted mobile artillery to try and keep up with the troops and they put the standard 15 centimeter german howitzer on the top um, it was a real problem because you imagine the small size of the panzer one um, they, they just built this sort of armoured shield, put the howitzer in it. It was so small um, that they didn't have any really room for ammunition. So the ammunition always had to be carried by a second vehicle. Um, and again, think of the problems there as well, because does it have to be armoured? Does it have to be tracked? What, there's no point having it in a soft skin if it's going into areas where it's trying to keep up with the panzers, etc. And a soft skin won't, won't be able to go to the same places, etc. So, um, but I don't know of a bison tank as in a real tank, as it were. So I don't know if that answers the question, but if I've, if I've missed something, come back to me. 
Um, Richard Everett made the uh, comment about going to the Tank Museum. We are open again, so again, please, please, if you've got the ch chance, you know, thank you for the nice comments. A lot of you are going to see that World War II exhibition. Lots of nice comments there. Um, you know, I really, again, as ever, um, whatever we're doing online, the real thing is by a visit to the Tank Museum, of course, if you possibly can make it. And uh, Richard was saying about why don't we do those old audio guys like we used to do. And that was a very conscious decision, Richard, because we found like a lot of our audience are actually family groups. And once you go with an audio guide, you tend to separate off. So everyone goes at slightly different paces, but they're listening in on these things, which might be very good and informative, but you lose that sense of a group experience. Um, and the fact that dad can't actually read something, talk to the kids, say, come and look at this, or mum read something somewhere else, and, uh, and that sort of engagement. And it was a very conscious decision to do that. Nowadays, we're looking at putting similar information that you can, whether it's QR codes or something else that you'll be able to download, or maybe even take to some of our online content. So if you want to know more, here's a way you could sit there and watch our tank chat on, on that sort of thing. So that's why we don't do it. We actually, um, and it, we also had the problems like many museums, which is there'll be days where there's just so many people coming into the galleries, you can't service everybody with them. Um, you know, they go missing a bit and everything else that way. And they were also very expensive for what you seem to get for it. So, so we, we, we didn't go down that route. Um, and they, they've been gone for oh, 10, 15 years, I wouldn't be surprised. Um, Kiwi Fruit asked a question I mentioned about uh, an Indian patent carrier and he said, you know, okay, so if you have located one, what's the process you go through to try and get hold of one of those things or bring it back to the UK? Um, now, th this is all touches on a range of subjects because number one, who owns it? Uh, number two, so again, you know, I always tell the stories of Russian mafia offering us tanks from uh, Russian collections, you know, just after the wall had come down and everything, and there was a lot of, well, not just after the wall had come down, late in that, um, there was a lot of stuff, you know, and we sort of email back and say, but this is in that museum, and they'd come back and say, yeah, big deal, well, you know, we can still get it. Um, so we have to, as a legitimate museum, number one, no provenance is the word often museums talk about, cultural property to the people that claim they own it, really own it, and is it more important to that particular country at times than, you know, just us having a long reach and being able to say, yes, we ought to come over to um, the Tank Museum. And obviously there's a raft of laws and legislation about military materials. So someone was suggesting the other day about, oh, you know, get a tank from Kablinka or whatever in the, the Soviet or the Moscow Tank Museum um, in Russia. Well, actually at the moment, there is a complete ban on import of any type of weaponry, not just from museums, but blanket ban um, from Russia um, because of the political situation. So all these types of things can affect what museums do in terms of acquisition. Um, it's um, less problematic when it's terms of borrowing in some areas. So that's why we encourage borrowing, you know, because that means you can often um, not get round things, but it, it becomes a, an easier task and just that idea of acquisition. And so you've got, as I mentioned, a, a lot of issues uh, to have to face up to before you can just sort of say, right, we're going to have that particular vehicle. Um, so clearances, is it coming from a part of the world where things are in dispute? You know, you're going to get people sort of saying, no, that belongs to us instead. Um, are there going to be, you, you know, a lot of people sort of afterwards getting fairly miffed that material has left, which is why different countries have, have obviously got sort of cultural laws and barriers and things. So, so providing we think we can find a legitimate route to buy that. And we also have to think about that when we take things from private collectors. What's its background before it got to that private collector? Is there going to be a, an issue, you know, that this is actually underneath it all con controversial or even potentially stolen property? Um, so that's something as a legitimate museum you have to be thinking about and being aware about. And we sign up to codes of ethics on that. The idea then about, you know, if somebody's saying, listen, I need, five million euros for it we don't have five million euros forget it you know straight away we're not in that game of being able to afford ridiculously big bucks we might be able to and a lot of people have been saying about you know um crowdfunding purchases or helping to fund things that way that is obviously something we'd be very keen on and be able to look into you do have to before you start any sort of crowdfunding exercise know what your target amount of money is 
what do you do with that money if you don't reach the target? Is everyone going to be very disappointed that they gave you that money? You know, do you have to put a caveat? You know, is it okay we keep this for other work if, if we don't reach the title? Because then handing it back, all you're doing is wasting time, money, resources, all sorts of things. But that idea is obviously something that's catching on in places. And obviously if you get a popular swell of opinion, as happened with works of art and all sorts of things, you know, where suddenly something that seemed impossible becomes possible because there's a bit of momentum behind it to be able to do it. Um, and then, of course, getting all the right permits and everything in place, manoeuvring stuff and bringing stuff around. So all these things are possible. We are still on the lookout, as I've mentioned before. Um, and there's other ways it can be done as well, which is why government to government, senior military, gifts, swaps, um, you know, diplomatic visits, when all those things sort of line up together, that's when sometimes suddenly something that may be able to happen that hasn't happened before, or it gives that other word momentum that uh, we alone can't always get to do. But, you know, like I say, if you, uh, we get emails all the time. I'm always keen that if you're emailing saying, I've got this, say straight away, I'm trying to sell this. It's not that we're against people trying to sell things or anything, but let's just make sure we're clear because sometimes we go down this trail of a series of exchanges and then the person says yes and then I want 50 million euros for it or something ridiculous so we've wasted each other's times because we're not in that game donations potentially swaps occasionally have been on the cards you know but again we're an accredited museum once it's in the collection proper we have a really clever or a clever a formal process before we can deaccession those items um, to make them available but we may have the opportunity to acquire another vehicle that doesn't come part of the collection that we can then offer up as a swap so that we can acquire something we do want for the collection so uh, I hope that kind of answers it even if it sounds like I'm making it sound a bit of a problem it is a bit of a problem but something that all museums have to engage in and try and sort through. Jeff Phillips makes a comment if you put me on at half speed I sound hilarious and drunk um, I, I haven't tried to do that but if you need cheering up everyone have a go at that um, people have asked again about David Fletcher. Well, the good news is now we're back at the museum. Um, I've just been talking to David, so we're going to start our filming process again. How long that will take before we're getting the regular tank chats coming out? Not too sure yet. We're going to have issues, obviously, opening hours when we can gain access and do all sorts of things. But at the same time, obviously, that, that's good news all round and you'll be able to see David Fletcher again. And he sends his regards as well. Thank you for everyone who's been uh, making comments, etc. And don't forget, you can buy your David Fletcher T-shirt if you go on to the, um, the shop. Um, Mark Edwards, your wife needs congratulating because um, she's obviously a fine, intelligent woman. She bought him a load of books and uh, sent them, he gave them to him as a present sort of stuff, everything. So how to get in the good books, ladies, um, by doing things like that, buying books from the Tank Museum shops. Well done, Mark. Um, tank, a uh, question, TM asks, would older weapons such as a 17 pounder go through modern tanks? Um, it's one of those ones I don't think we'll ever find out because the, the chance of you having the opportunity to do firing is getting less and less and less with older weapons. I know they do in some parts of the world, but the ammunition is, you know, getting harder to find or you've got to make it up and everything. And will it really be of the same specification as wartime ammunition? The idea then that you're actually going to find a modern vehicle or the armour systems to fire at. If you go back to the modelling systems or the range tables or what it's supposed to go through, trying to actually say, you know, a 17 pounder that was supposed to go through X amount of inches or millimetres of uh, roll to modulus armour at this degree and etc. The modern tank is going to have a very different set of um, laminates, different ways it's going to be protected. So trying to find how that works as a sort of you know comparison even if you're doing it on range tables is probably impossible to do um so it's kind of one of those rule of you know finger in the air have a guess yeah it looks that way but um you know goodness knows what chobham armor does to something like a, an old style ap round i'd like to think it stops it in 99 uh, of the cases but like with all these things that's another issue about weapon systems how they learn is by trialing different types of weapon systems against different types of armour protection because even though you didn't think they were going to be fired at each other sometimes they do. Um, so where do we get to again? So we've done that one. Uh, Michael Fuller I got the pleasure I don't know if you remember some time ago we had um, a very charming nurse said could you mention my fellow Michael Fuller who's an ambulance driver she's a nurse actually his partner 
and we had the great pleasure of saying hello in the museum, so well done Michael. Um, and, uh, and it was nice to meet your other half, sorry I've forgotten her name. Um, but, um, but yeah, thanks very much for making the effort to come down and, uh, and it's good to see people and sort of see faces, you know, like we see all these people that have emailed all the time or make comments all the time and then they say hello and you're thinking, who the hell are you? But they seem to feel like they know you and of course as soon as you start talking then you realise, oh yeah, you're the one who says whatever. Um, Julie, uh, Julie Mids, is it, uh, asks a question, how does a tank museum divvy up the work? And I know a couple of other people said, you know, what's your role compared to and other things that way. Um, I think I've mentioned this one before, but whether it was some patrons, so we have a board of trustees that meet a few times a year and they are entrusted, hence the word trustees, to look after and be responsible for the strategic running of the tank museum. Are we doing the right things? Are we meeting our trustee? Are we doing, keeping in the right direction, etc.? And giving us advice and, you know, contacts and you name it sort of stuff. So that trustee board is made up of range. We have military, serving military, ex-military industry, uh, media, that sort of thing, local interest, so that, that we try and keep a range on the board to give us advice and give us a steer. They, we report to that trustee board. There's a couple of subcommittees that report into the trustee boards. We have a collection committee that looks after, it sounds, a collection, acquisition, disposal. Are we keeping things to the right standard? And we have an exec committee that looks after some of the more financial areas where what's coming in, what's going out, does this look sensible? And where we've got, as we have done for the last you know, 20 years, it seems, had major building projects going on in the background, just making sure the ship's keeping afloat and we're keeping an eye on those major capital projects. Uh, and they report in and the staff reports to the main trustee board, but also these other two bodies. Um, and the staff then, so it goes down to the director uh, of the Tank Museum is Richard Smith. You've seen some of his videos coming on. And then there's a team of senior managers. So we've got a collections manager, and again, you'll see him on some of the videos. That's uh, Chris Van Schadenberg. We've got a media and marketing side. We've got a kind of almost like running the, the museum manager, like keeping an eye on the inside and the, and the, and the shop. Um, we've got myself as curator and that management team then has staff under it and as with all organisations that structure morphs and changes over time or, or you know things that become pertinent at one point lose their pertinence or again things things change around that way in terms of the overall areas of responsibility and I know someone asked before you know what does a curator do I find it hard sometimes to actually try and explain some of the things but because I've been there a long time I've done some of those other jobs which is why sometimes people come to me and say when I'm having to say look actually it's this guy's job here um, and as we've expanded an organization inevitably because when you think about again I come back to what museums are up to certainly in our case um, because we are not centrally funded with a chunk of money every year, as it were, a big grant, we have to be running as a business to make the money. And at the same time, we're running a museum, which some of that parts of the museum obviously make money. You want people to come and see everything. Other parts, we're having to make money to keep it funded. So, you know, conservation, restoration, running an archive and library and doing all those other things. So there's a real plethora of activities that go on in a museum where sometimes other things you know if you're running a shop you just tend to be profit motivated that's it whereas of course we have also ethical issues we've got um, all sorts of other issues and, uh, and impositions on us um, across one organization so you can imagine there's always going to be and anybody who works in museums you know from a sort of you know this it's always set up as commercial is always going to be trying to get the collection people to do things that the collection people don't do and vice versa and everything you know which is is not always true but it's is you can see that problem of an organization with so many different strands but with one ultimate aim sort of thing Finn come around here come on what do you think what have you found someone Finn sniffing out the back there he says someone's walked past um Right, okay, so I hope that answers that little bit there, even if it's not that clear, but um, ask anyone who works at the Tank Museum. Um, so whatever, where do we get to? Um, yeah, Vargas asked a name uh, about why does the NATO didn't give names for tanks where it does? It gives a sort of code name for most other Warsaw Pact kit. So if you go back to the Cold War era, we were coming up with in NATO 
names for instead of coming up with the Russian full name or mark of you know aeroplane we were coming up with flogger or coming up with simple ones so so you know their anti-tank missiles saga we were going to call that one so they come up with these names but funny enough in tanks they don't seem to have done and your question is well why not i can't actually find an answer for that yet other than maybe t62 or t64 were clear enough on their own without having to come up with other bits. Uh, although I do know that they, in some areas, they do end up with some names um, for submarks. So for example, the T-72, when it came out with that, um, whether they were unofficial, this is what I couldn't work out, um, where they came out with the extra armor on the front of the T-72 turret, um, again, I believe it was jokingly called in NATO, the Dolly Parton, because of these extra bulges on the front of the turret. And uh, whether that was an official one or it was just a, another one of these, because you can imagine lots of different units and subsections in NATO are going to have to come up with, because they've got specific areas of interest, they've probably come up with their own system of how do you remember this, what is it about that, and, uh, and you go to the recognition, you know, lots of journals used to be done in the Cold War. This is one of those things that's drifted subsequently. And with the way of the world again, I wonder if it's going back up again, where, you know, just keeping an eye on all the different variants there, because it used to be a big part of a NATO is just keeping an absolute eye on what the threat equipment was, because we really needed to know, as it were. Um, now, of course, China, Russia again, um, that idea about those levels of interest in what the equipment is, what its capabilities are, how do we disseminate that interest to the troops? So, you know, at one point, recognition was vitally important, seems to die a death a bit and comes back again. And part of that touches on a subject that I know someone else was, um, I've lost the ball, so here we go. Um, someone else asked about, which was along the lines of um, blue on blue incidents, which quite often, not always, but quite often come down to recognition issues. Blue on blue or fratricide, it's when you're fighting with an ally or even within your own forces where you end up accidentally knocking out or killing your own troops. And it's been a consistent thing through history. And it made me, um, because a couple of people asked questions about it, it made me go and dig out. I just thought I'd read to you a couple of incidences on blue and blue from different sides in the Second World War. Um, this is the book I was mentioning before, Brazen Chariots by Major Robert Chris. Alas, we don't have this in the shop, but you might be able to find yourself a copy um, kicking around somewhere. Um, Finn has managed to collapse this tennis ball. <laughs> Which means I have trouble trying to pick it up. Um, but here we go with um, yeah, Brazen Chariots. This is Robert Crisp, who's um, out in the desert in North Africa. He finds a unit and he's supposed to be going out. So he basically asks a the question, then there's nothing out this way, sir, I asked, pointing to the northeast, towards which I would be going to rejoin my squadron on the march. No, he replied, if you come across anything over in that way, it's not likely to be friendly. I saluted and left him. In the east, the sky was red with the promise of day. A mist hung over the desert, thickened by the dust churned up by the passing of many vehicles in the still air. Suddenly, out of this obscurity, two shapes emerged. I was, I suppose, less than two miles from the city of London Yeomanry Leaguer. I halted the troop and stared through my binoculars. No identification pennants, no wireless masks, turrets clamped down and low squat lines of the panzer. We edged a little closer. There was no movement from the two tanks with their, their backs to me, towards me, facing east. The nearer I got, the more they looked like Mark III's, but I was still not sure, chiefly because the last thing I expected to see there were two isolated panzers. But by now, the unexpected was commonplace. I signalled to my other tanks to halt and stay where they were. I was going to make dead sure what these two vehicles were before attacking them. I rushed headlong towards them on a diagonal course at about 30 miles an hour. If they were Jerry and they saw me, I'd had plenty of speed to play with and my course would make it me a difficult target. I kept going towards them until with my naked eye, I could count the one, two, three, four, five, six bogey wheels. I had closed to within 200 yards and, as I, and I had satisfied myself beyond doubt that they were Mark III's. I watched their turrets anxiously as my honey wheeled round behind them, but they did not swing round after me. I got on the air to my troop of tanks, told them there were two Mark III's and they were to open fire as soon as I rejoined them. 
I pulled up about 30 yards away from the troop, Sergeant's tank, gave him a thumbs up, and then our cannons blazed out. I put four shots into the nearest jerry and saw the crew bailing out. By this time, the other one had moved off in a hurry and was jinking about the desert, its turret swinging around towards me as it moved. I could see the traces of our shells whizzing past it. One, two, they went ricocheting high into the air. I saw a crusader speeding across the desert towards us and I thought, that's fine, now we'll get the bastard. Then I looked again, my heart coming into my mouth in sheer horror. An officer was standing, sitting on the front of the crusader, waving a red flag. I knew immediately what I had done. Cease fire, I yelled at my gunner and then into the mic at the troop sergeant. I had knocked out one of our own tanks. I jumped down and ran over to the approaching crusader and altogether we went to the shattered tank. Three men were clustered around it, scared and bewildered and shocked. One was holding his right arm tight against his side. There was one man short. All the way over I kept muttering to myself, don't let anybody be dead, don't let anybody be dead. I ran to the little group. A young officer was in command. He waited for me with his blanched face. You bloody fool, you killed my gunner. I hated him at that moment as much as he hated me. He wanted to hit me, I could see that. I didn't say anything. If he didn't understand how I felt, there was nothing I could say that would make him. They got a rope around the figure lying in the turret. I had neither the strength nor the will to help. Perhaps he wasn't dead. Perhaps he was just unconscious. The officer might have made a mistake. There was still a little hope. Out of the turret top, they hauled a lad's body. Red hair, fair skin, freckle face. As they pulled him out, the head rolled sideways and two wide open empty eyes looked straight into mine. In that moment, I touched the rock bottom of experience. And he goes on, you know, how that affects him. And he just sort of says later, he says, many years later, I met a tall young man in Fleet Street who said pleasantly, you won't remember me, but we have met before. I'm afraid I can't recall. It was one early morning in the desert. I was in a crusader that you knocked out. For a moment or two, I was speechless, living again the horror of that moment. Then I said, remember you? I wish to hell I could forget you. His next words were unexpected. Bloody good shooting, he said, grinning broadly. There were four holes in the turret before we could even get the engine started. He must have had a fine, damn go good gunner. So that's Brazen Chariots by Robert Chris, and uh, kind of uh, slightly shorter, you'll be pleased to know. So this is from Tiger Battalion 507, a book um, that was put together by, uh, it was veterans accounts in the 1980s. And uh, this is the, another version of that fratricide or um, ending up killing guys on your own side. Um, this is a, from a driver's point of view, he's in a tiger, he's on the Eastern Front. We were heading towards the enemy. After a heavy snowstorm, we cleared, uh, after a heavy snowstorm cleared, we suddenly had before us some Russian tanks which we engaged immediately. The last of them fell victim to a barrage of fire under the leadership of the company commander. After that, it all fell quiet on the enemy side, just two heaps of mangled steel. When we were pushing forward across the plain, next day Ivan raked us with artillery fire which began to come over ever closer. I was not aware that we were carrying infantry on the hull because Heinrich failed to inform me when we made a short stop in a village. Our attack petered out. I put the engine into neutral, selected the fourth reverse gear and awaited the order to reverse. Meanwhile, Ivan's guns had got our range and his shells were falling all around us. I heard the expected order in my earphones and my pressure on the starter button wiped out two German soldiers. The Panzer bobbed slightly and then burrowed back into the snow. I saw before us our, on our tracks in the snow a pair of boots and a kind of small suitcase. Drive a halt, I heard the order ring in my ears and then there was a deadly silence. Franz, I asked the radio operator, what is that case ahead? He fired a brief burst with his machine gun and the suitcase blew up. It probably contained hand grenades. Now I heard in the earphones, Man, those poor boys, we've run over two of them. I couldn't fully grasp what had happened. The horror of it choked me. The attack continued. Later, we established the tragic details. The infantry with us had taken cover from the artillery fire behind the panzer and failed to react quickly enough when I reversed. 
As we proceeded, the snow began to obscure my viewing slit and I cleared it away with my boots. I entered a village whose cottages were taken under fire from three sides. The effect was enormous. Russian troops poured out from every door and window and looked at their heels eastward up the hill. The brown clad figures were easy to pick out against the snow. Under our MG fire, only a few had the chance to escape alive. Finally, all movement in the snow stopped. The attack was called off and we rolled back to Oliev. I parked the tiger and bedded it on straw in front of our quarters. I could see strips of flesh in the tracks, a ghastly sight. We asked some of the infantrymen about the unfortunate victims. They were a 19 year old and a family man from the Sudetenland. We went into our lodgings depressed and sad. So, as I mentioned, so lots of interesting little details, first-hand accounts, some of them quite bitty, but that when they, if you read the whole book, uh, which we do have, as I say, in the shop, um, it builds up that picture of what it was like in a Tiger unit. Um, and as I say, the 507s, they're formed in 43 and they fight through to the end of the war and personal photos, etc. I'd recommend that one as well. Um, so, yeah, talking about the... Uh, um, the, the, the still to this day real big problem of fratricide and why recognition, as we mentioned, it was such an important feature. Um, SDKS, he asks a question saying T-tanks, um, why are T-tanks in the Soviet Union being built at the same time as their rivalries, etc.? I can answer that, but I'd suggest, hang on, hang far a bit, um, we've just done a tank chat on the T-54-55 and we're going to be doing the Soviet tanks, so that story will be telling better than I can tell you now on one of our tank chats soon to come in the, the near future, we hope. Um, and SDKS, no, that's the same guy, sorry, Mihi, um, whose real name, he came back to us, David, um, he mentions a point, he was saying, why have we, you know, a bit more politely this time, come here, Finn, come here. Finn. Yeah, come here, with the ball. He mentions the case, come here, up here, of um, why we have, um, you know, the emphasis on the German stuff and everything else with the British Tank Museum, um, get rid of the German stuff. I would argue against that just for the simple one, which is to understand the British tank man's um, problems, the equipment, what he was up against, his achievements, etc. You need to see what the enemy had. So it gives it a context to the British stuff. And uh, I know a number of people get all worked up because we seem to go on and too much about the Germans when we're the British Tank Museum. Um, it's where the interest is so often. Uh, we try and adjust that, let's, let's balance it, let's get more about the British story. And on that score, you then go on to actually ask about um, the naming conventions for British tanks, not just this business about why do they all start with C, contentious, you know, cavalier, etc., that sort of thing, but more about what are the names on the sides of the tank. And that brings us onto this big subject of tank markings. If we just look at the British in the Second World War, um, I'm just going to take you through some of those ones and recommend a book or so to you as well. Um, but the, the issue that I see there about, uh, or that so many people warn you about when you're talking about this particular area of subjects is um, it, there's no hard and fast rules. There seems to be conventions, but you will always find exceptions um, to those rules. So watch it all the time in the sense you can't always rely on what should have been done actually happened. And when you are trying to interpret the markings on a vehicle um, and therefore come to a conclusion, careful because again, some vehicles never actually, you know, serve with that unit or they, they change their, their use and they weren't repainted, etc. So we can make mistakes that way. Um, but on that score, I just wanted to go through. So what are the things on a tank? So there's a whole series of markings which you can take apart and start explaining. In terms of where it fits in a unit or its formation, starting at the top is a formation sign, which tends to be a divisional sign, um, and they don't mind putting that on. There used to be regimental badges sometimes, on, uh, but they tend to be got away with because it was giving too much information. Divisions didn't seem to matter so much, so you may find a divisional sign uh, on a vehicle. Then you have that little square box, which sometimes is a single colour, two colours or three colours in bands or diamond shaped um, and that has a number in it. Now that's what they call the formation sign and the colouring relates to whether it's Royal Armoured Corps, Royal Artillery etc, one of the other corps and the number normally in white letters that's set on that 
is a code number in essence for an individual unit that is fighting in that formation. So where's that ball again, Finn? Back here, come here, that's it, drop it. And um, why I mentioned that one, because that unique number is obviously there to stop saying, you know, this is the unit, we don't say that on there. But those numbers, they are, um, you can find the lists of what those numbers relate to within the different formations at different times, the different armies. Um, careful as well because a number could be repeated at another point in the war in a different campaign. Um, so again, that's another one of those, be warned. Um, if you think you found it, just you need, you need some other qualifiers as well to be able to sort of get that one. But that's those little squares you see on there. Normally, as I say, the number that's in there is, is in white. And then you go down to another level. Now there's other markings as well. I won't go into all of them, but you know, like the round circle with a bridging weight, how much that, uh, so that again, for the engineers, as you're coming up to a bridge or military police, they can see if you're going to be too heavy for that capability of the bridge you're um, approaching. Come here, Finn, come on. Um, and there will be a T number on the side if it's a tank T and then a unique serial number. That is a number for that particular vehicle that stays with the vehicle, whatever unit or operation it's going on. Other types of soft skin vehicles have different prefixes as well, but T is pretty obvious, goes with tank. Um, now the tactical markings on a tank, which are the shapes on the side of the turret, to identify that, what part of the regiment you are in, um, they're quite common and quite, quite often seen. They date back to the 1930s, late 20s, early 30s. You'll see them, they're being developed on British vehicles, on exercises, and that carries on throughout the war. And so the idea is that you get a diamond shape. If you see that painted on a turret, that's headquarters squadron of a unit, of a regiment. If you go to the triangle, that's your A squadron. Uh, a square is B squadron and a circle is C squadron. And if there is a fourth squadron, which some units did have at certain times, it tends to be an oblong, uh, a squash square in essence, sort of like looking that way. And that will indicate the D squadron. And again, if they're repeating this with the different regiments in a, in a larger formation, those colours painted on the side could be in different colours. So, for example, the first regiment uh, would be in red, the second regiment in terms of seniority would be in yellow, third regiment would be in blue, but that tends to get done away with and it tends to just sit with a single colour and those shapes, but you'll see those shapes a lot. And quite often as well within that shape, so if it's a triangle for A squadron, there may be a number. And again, confusingly, the way they do the numbering uniquely for that, you know, this idea of saying, you know, you're the first tank in A squadron, second tank, third tank, some units then carry on numerically, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, as you go through the other squadrons. Um, some repeat, um, so they go back to, if you're in B squadron in a square, you could be one first tank in B squadron. Um, and so it all gets, as I say, can be a little bit confusing or a little hard to pin down. And then there's the simple fact that not everybody then follows this. So for example, um, the 13th, 18th Royal Hussars ended up painting big numbers on the sides of their vehicles. And so if you're in A squadron, you actually had a number from 22 to 36. If you're in B squadron, it was from 44 to 58. And if you're in C squadron, 66 to 80. And if you were HQ squadron, any number below 20. Um, and so they'll have that on the side. Um, and different, <laughs> this is where again, why I say that. So different units at different times have different ways of identifying tactically. And the other thing that I think the original question was really pointing at as well, which is where do the names that you see on the side of the vehicle painted, where do they come from? Is there a convention? Is there something there? And normally I would have to say, yes, there is a convention, but it doesn't always follow as a pattern. There are anomalies and different regiments and units will come up with a different convention about how they do that naming. So for example, Royal Tank Regiment, Back in the First World War, the battalions of the Royal Tank Regiment, it was A Battalion, B Battalion, C Battalion. Later, they get uh, 39 when they become regiments, the battalions become a regiments when the Royal Armoured Corps formed. The idea that you then have what was A Battalion becomes 1st Royal Tank Regiment, B Battalion, 2nd Royal Tank Regiment, C Battalion, you can see where this is going. So that idea that the, in the Second World War, if you were, were in A Battalion, or what was now 1st Royal Tank Regiment, you painted a name on your tank that started with the letter A. 
again, if you're in the 2nd Royal Tank Regiment, i.e. the old B Battalion, it was names with B, etc. Now that works quite nicely through until you run out of letters in the alphabet, and of course later on there was Royal Tank Regiments, 48 RTR, etc. that were higher numbers than alphabetical letters available. So they came to different conclusions and some of their units ended up by having names that for A as a squadron you would end up saying let, uh, names beginning with A, B had names beginning with B and C. So the convention doesn't always work even within the Royal, Ta Art, um, Royal Tank Regiments. Um, the, uh, and another one with Royal Tanks, for example, when the 11th Royal Tank Regiment gave up on tanks and got the buffaloes, for the Rhine crossing, they ended up coming up with a new convention of names and they went for S letter towns. Hence, our buffalo has got seven oaks on the side. So it was names of British towns beginning with S. That was the convention for 11th Royal Tank Regiment with the buffaloes. Um, cavalry, sometimes the cavalry name their tanks after previous horses. Um, some units after uh, dogs from the pack, you know, or previous um, animals from the band, all sorts of things were going on in cavalry regiments, so the different conventions there. Household cavalry at one point had all the names of uh, towns on the sides of the vehicles and they were named after the driver's hometown, um, which of course you don't repaint every time you get a new driver, so that, that system kind of uh, starts falling apart. Just going to have a slurp of my tea here. Out of my nice, by the way, don't forget your I Love Tanks mug. Um, 8th King's Royal Irish Hussars had racehorses, um, names of racehorses, so um, hence Abbot of, Abbess of Chantry and everything that's on the Bill Bellamy books. Um, so you've got, and some units had their battle honours or towns where they recruited as their, their names on their tanks. So quite often there is a, a, a relevance or something you can see in that naming convention. And if you are interested in that, these are where I'd recommend two books that unfortunately we don't have. They're out of print now, but you might be able to find them on Amazon. Again, look around. Sometimes they have high prices. Do a bit of burrowing. You can find them a bit cheaper. British military markings, 39 to 45. Peter Hodges and Michael Taylor. There's that one um, that was Canon Publications. It's a kind of like an updated version of an earlier one. And British Tank Markings and Names by... BT White, who again, anything BT White, grab it while you can, really good stuff. And he talks a lot in there about those naming conventions and how that was come by and how you can interpret those signs on tanks. So again, two books I'd recommend there, um, as well as, as I was mentioning earlier, our nice Tiger Battalion one. So um, I hope that uh, answers that kind of questions or give you a little bit of a, a, a steer in that direction. Now we get lots of comments as you can see and sometimes you know everything going on in the world and all different things. The favourite one for last time, thank you Dave, you didn't say the name of your 80 year old mum you're um, in lockdown with but um, your mum likes Finn who's down there staring at the ball at the moment and uh, as you explained to us you, you know, quite often she you call her in, watch Finn, she has a sneaky glass of port and then potters off to bed. Um, I do apologise to your mother for mentioning her age in front of everybody, but um, I don't, you didn't say your name, but um, here's to Dave, to your mother, and if she is there, my chance for a sneaky glass of port in the morning. So, um, what's that? That's a tawny, I think. Anyway, so different types of port. We can go into port. Shall we go into port? Tor Ruby, tawny, vintage. I haven't got time for a vintage this morning. Um, but anyway, enjoy your port, and I hope you do still enjoy Finn. And don't forget, Dave, if you really want to um, impress her, what about a Finn puppet? Or, on request, by the way, people said, why don't we do a Finn plush toy? There's a Finn plush toy for you. And you can even, I gather, stuff your hand up inside here and do all your stuff for it and everything else but um, I'm not going to become a ventriloquist I've decided that but anyway there's that one for Finn and I'll throw the ball for him and keep him occupied um, so thank you for your comments as ever on those ones what else can we come on to then so other things that I would um, I've mentioned about the books um, if you're a First World War fan, we've got a really interesting, and I have to say, I was impressed by the ones that are on here. Um, it's from a BBC. They've done a, it says it's nine disc box set of uh, documentaries on the First World War, different ones, including one we were involved in that I have to say was very high production value, Churchill's First World War's in there. Um, 
but there's a lot on there that was all that stuff that came out over the first World War anniversary. So there's that one there, that's 9 99 um, If you are still a DVD person, I still am, and certain generational things, uh, don't forget Kelly's Heroes, we did the review on it. If you like your tanks and war movies and you haven't seen Kelly's Heroes, you really ought to get hold of a copy, um, that's there. Um, I've got them here. Um, again, we've got all those different coloured um, shimags, shimu, um, that you wear around your neck, around your head, that you see. And I, I was just yesterday, and we saw, um, what was it, a jackal drove past us, and the guys were all wearing these still, even in the UK. So you always think of them as a kind of deserty thing, but um, they were picked up that, you know, around your head, around your neck, like a scarf or something. Or, of course, you could buy it for the other half, and uh, or they could buy it for you, and, uh, you know, multi-sex, whatever. Um, have I mentioned? Right, here we go. Kobe, those blocks um, put together ones. There's a nice Sherman there. Um, I'm always amazed at who's buying this. You always think that's for younger people. No, it's not. Actually, it's the adults buying these as well, and they're really nice models. Um, back to, that takes me back to my youth. I made the uh, Tamiya Tiger. Um, I think I entered it into a competition in, it was a model competition in the Leaf Hall on Seaside Road in Eastbourne when I was a youngster. And I think somewhere I probably still got the certificate for doing that. I can't remember, I don't think I won anything, but anyway, but there you go, your classic Tiger model from Tamir that's been around a while. Um, we're back to, there's our, some of you may have seen before. If you like, um, we've got our inflatable shells, of course, but there's our lovely little flask. So um, if you fancy um, boy, girl, whoever, that will bound to impress, isn't it, obviously. And I know some of you will be looking here wondering why we've got this, what look like some American modern shape, what they call them, Fritz helmets type of thing sat here. This is actually, you can open it up. And there you have, it's actually a kid's backpack. Um, so there's the carrying straps on the front there. All of, what are we, £4.99 for that. And inside, I purposely put that so you can see, they're magnetic, so it'll stick to the fridge or your wall or, or your Tiger tank if you happen to have one and you need to make notes. That'll stick inside your turret. And uh, there's your notepad with Tiger on or your notepad with the Tank Museum logo on. But um, point being there with uh, something to put in, there is your perfect back to school any excuse to um, have a backpack that's actually looked like a helmet. So um, there's that one. Um, people still showing me their ankles as I walk around the museum and I keep wondering why and I keep remembering we're selling, don't forget, our still with uh, other colours, I believe, is coming in. Tank Museum socks with all the different bits and pieces on that way. And um, I was just informed as well before we were doing all this that uh, we've got some more Haynes manuals, but we also got some at really knocked down prices. I think there's a Panhard, there's the, the mini version on the Churchill, which, the, you know, these smaller icon ones, they do all the same information from the bigger ones in a slightly smaller size. And I think we've got them where it's ridiculously knocked down prices. So again, go back, have a look, have a look through there. And as I always mention, we may have restocked in some areas. We may have got better prices. We may have got better postage as well. So, you know, if there are things there that, that, that take your fancy, you've got a chance to order. Um, so I think I've done my, um, my selling piece. Um, um, as I mentioned, Finn has finished his jigsaw, our Mark IV Haynes jigsaw. So he'll show you that in a moment. But as ever, thank you so much for getting through to this far on this end. Thank you if you have been buying stuff. If you can't afford it, as I say, I hope you enjoy the material um, we're putting out and uh, we'll see you next time for whatever the next one's going to be. So um, thanks very much. In these difficult times, obviously your support is really valued. So please do keep following us on social media, do subscribe to our channel. And, and if you've got the opportunity, perhaps order something from our shop uh, join one of our schemes like Patreon or our friends organisation and we'll try and keep going with giving you some content to keep you informed and entertained.